perhaps the opposite of Ober's paradox example here. In your notebooks on page 33, you're going to take some time, pun intended, to answer this question up here. Do you think time travel or time machines are possible? I do recognize that it's the same question here. This is going to be your initial thoughts, and then after we throw some science your way, your thoughts again. And they may be the same as your initial, but uh, this will be a more informed uh, write-up with a bit of evidence from things we present for you. This over here is an actual classified ad that was placed in a newspaper. Um, somebody to go back in time with me is what's wanted, not a joke. All right, so we're going to set the timer for about four minutes. You can pause the video and come back after four minutes of jotting down whether you think time travel or time machines are possible. Annual meeting of time travelers. So the DeLorean as a possible time machine. And time machines are actually already here. Do you think time travel will ever be possible? Well, going back in time, that is. Show me. Right this way, sir, to a real honest-to-goodness time machine. It takes light quite a bit of time to reach us. We've mentioned before how the nearest star system takes four years for the light to reach us, just over four. Uh, you've known since probably about eighth grade that it takes about eight minutes for the light to reach us. So when you're looking at these particular objects, you're seeing that light as it was that many years, hours, or minutes ago. That Sirius star just below Orion to the left, that light you're seeing from the brightest star in our sky, it's nine years ago how that light appeared. So Mr. Ferris is correct in saying everything we see in the sky belongs to the past. If an alien in a galaxy 65 million light years away is looking at us through a telescope right now, then they're looking at dinosaurs. Speaking of the past, when you remember a past event, you're actually remembering the last time you remembered it, not the event itself. Time is definitely something that makes you go, hmm. Imagine that an alien from another planet and another planetary system comes and selects you to be the ambassador for Earth, and they ask you to describe what time is. Not to teach them what time is, but what is this concept of time? And time is just crazy, because the more you think about time, the more you begin to realize we don't know what time is. It's uh, it's a human construct. It's something that uh, humans have invented, uh, created for the survival, perhaps, of a species. Imagine if we didn't have this concept or construct of time. We'll explore time uh, more so when we consider Einstein's theories of relativity, but uh, time is certainly an interesting topic within cosmology and perfectly demonstrates how cosmology tends to have you ask more questions than we're able to answer. So more questions than what we can have answers for. Gotta love cosmology. So one of the facets of cosmology is coming to an understanding of how a universe is a universe, how it comes to be. And this is where we look at Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Synthesis, create, develop, nucleo, center, nucleus. What is the hubble lemaitre law? Well, before we get to that law, we need to first look at this gentleman here, and the gentleman here being Vesto Slipher. So down here, we want to add the surname of Slipher. And we'll see if you can use the clue here to think what Vesto Slipher, uh, U.S. astronomer, discovered. The redshift. He's the one who discovered that galaxies are redshifting, meaning 
through the Earth perspective, look through telescopes, the majority of galaxies are redshifted or redshifting, meaning that relative to the Earth, these galaxies seem to be moving away from us. Now, it's not all the galaxies. For example, the Andromeda galaxy, our closest neighboring galaxy, is on a collision course with us. So that would be a blue shift, uh, something definitely we don't need to worry about. Uh, definitely in the next two years, or maybe 200 or 2,000 or 200,000, maybe 20,000 as a compromise. So uh, most of the galaxies we look at, we see a redshift. They're moving away from us. This gentleman here is George Lemaitre, and he is from Europe, and he discovers that uh, these galaxies, not only are they redshifting, shift, red but the farther away these galaxies are from us, the faster they seem to be moving away. So the Hubble-Lemaitre law, discovered both by Lemaitre in Europe and Hubble in the US, not necessarily the same exact time, but same time period in the 1920s, and independent of each other, uh, for the longest time, just known as Hubble's Law, but more uh, correctly recognized as the Hubble-Lemaitre Law. So we want to have two things here, one of which being that the galaxies are redshifted, so the majority of the galaxies we see are moving away from Earth, and the second component is the fact that the farther away these galaxies are from Earth, the faster they're moving away, the faster their redshift. So two components for the Hubble-Lemaitre law. One, galaxies are redshifting, most of them, moving away from Earth. And the fact that the farther the galaxies are from Earth, the faster they seem to be moving away. George Gamow is a Russian-born Americanized astronomer, astrophysicist, cosmologist, and he's the first to promose, propose the concept that if everything is farther away from us than it once was, logic dictates that it was once closer. Like if I walk up to you, and I slowly back away from you, half meter every second or so, if I were to run that scenario backwards, then every second in the past, I was a half meter closer to you. Gamal took this logic and put it towards the cosmos in the sense of the galaxies are proven to be moving away from us. And so if this axis is time, like the present, run the scenario to the beginning of this time construct, then your logic, common sense dicta dictates that the galaxies had to have been closer and closer and closer till ultimately all the matter was at one single point in time. And we perfectly call this a singularity. A singularity is where all the mass of the universe existed at one point in time, and this is an infinitely dense singularity. The mass in such a small volume is just mind-blowing for how high of a density you have. So we have all the mass, all the matter in the universe existing in a single point in time, and a point is even too large to uh, use as comparison. The idea that the singularity could fit on a pinhead is still way too big of a scale. Pinpoint is still too tremendously large. It's just one of those things we have to kind of accept. We can't possibly imagine how tiny this singularity is. Now, one of the first questions people ask cosmologists would be, okay, so we have this singularity, but what was before the singularity? Well, that is something that we are considering and exploring within the world of cosmology. And a few more slides into the presentation, we'll look at that concept and that thought. Current thought, though, is to think about this word squircle I've come up with. It's because you can't quite circle, you can't quite make a square or rectangle. So you're going to squircle and explain which diagram part. Uh, properly, models Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. 
Will I ever get my words in the right order at which I want them? Probably not in life. Let's try that again. Squircle and explain which diagram properly models Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Much better. I don't know if it'll be an improvement for former student Amber Huddleston of mine, who was one of my very first year students when I was a first year teacher. It wasn't her first year as being a student, but uh, anyhow, she said she uh, watched the uh, density video on my Smithonomy YouTube channel and wondered how the kids stayed awake with my soothing voice. There you go. Not editing any of that out. All right, so here we go. The complex situation of modeling representing BBN. This first image at the top of the slideshow here is what most people tend to think of when they think of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Thinking here that there's this emptiness space, and then there's a singularity, then there's this massive explosion in space of all the matter and mass that we currently have, has always, have always had, and will always continue to have. Big Bang nucleosynthesis is very different though. This is the one you'll want to squircle. And the key concept is to recognize that before the singularity, there was nothing. There wasn't space. There was not a universe of nothing. And then all of a sudden there was all the mass present. What we have here is nothing, but some people consider nothing to be something. So something can't be nothing. So maybe the nothing is something. So the key thing to note is that this example up here, this is actually an explosion in space representation, which is not correct. So this one right here we're saying is an explosion in space, and that's not what Big Bang nucleosynthesis is representing. What we're saying is that is an expansion of space. So four letters together, two individually here, two individually here that make an enormous difference of cosmic proportions, if you will. So it's not that we had emptiness and there was an explosion in space, but the singularity itself is an expansion of space. There was no space or time before this. And this is definitely one of the great pursuits in cosmology is exploring, all right, what is the origin of the singularity? And specifically beyond just saying an enormous amount of heat causes this expansion of the singularity, how do you go from here to here? Now, something to try and wrap our head around even further is just how rapidly this expansion occurred. Help you out with a sense of scale here. If you imagine a speck of dust, this speck of dust on this chart, if the atom here were the smallest thing on the continuum, our scale of comparison, and the earth here were the largest thing, this speck of dust would be halfway in the middle on the spectrum from smallest thing to the largest thing. Speck of dust, equal in size differentiation between an atom and the Earth. It's uh, this basis that we're going to think about of the rate of expansion. So think atom, which is very, very small. You think atom, your uh, dot at the end of a sentence has about one billion atoms. That's a hundred million atoms and the rate of the expansion of the singularity. So if this single atom represented the singularity, which is way too big for the size of the singularity, in a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a second, the singularity ex would have expanded from atom size to baseball size in a millionth of a millionth and a millionth of a millionth of a second. Since it's hard for us to comprehend how small the atom is, let's uh, do another scale of this rapid expansion. If we took a golf ball, that was the singularity to represent this rate of expansion. If the singularity of a golf ball in a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a second, that golf ball would have expanded to the size of our planet Earth. 
Stephen Hawking here. If the rate of expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in a hundred thousand million million, it would have recollapsed before it reached its present size. On the other hand, if it had been greater by a part in a million, the universe would have expanded too rapidly for stars and planets to form. Very critical, delicate uh, operation here. Thus, since the universe is expanding, astronomy would be a growing field. The whole universe is expanding, so why be surprised that we're drifting apart? And you can't blame your relationship failures on the universe. Unfortunately, just as Kyle sets his glass down, the universe expands. Likewise, you can't explain away your klutziness for the expansion of the universe, because you have to recognize when we're talking expansion of the universe and the um, expansion, we're talking about the space between galaxies that's expanding, not the galaxies themselves, not the objects, the mass within the galaxy. So we're never going to have this type of a situation in this uh, cartoon as Kyle is experiencing. Well, we'll have that situation. We just can't blame it on universe expansion. It's the space between galaxies, the fabric of the cosmos, that is doing the expanding, not the mass itself. Yes, we have finally discovered why the universe is expanding away from us. It's scared of humans. So, this is what you will want to stop kind of thinking with Big Bang Nucleosynthesis, that is this explosion in space. We want to change your mindset to this understanding that it's an expansion of space. Sir Fred Hoyle is a cosmologist from the United Kingdom, and he was doing an interview kind of like on NPR, National Public Radio. You're all too young to sit and listen to people argue about things on uh, your free time. One day you might just tune into NPR and realize oh, you are full-fledged adulting. So Sir Frederick Hoyle was on a radio show and the radio host was asking if the new research coming from the team of Gamal had uh, been studied and read up by Sir Fred Hoyle's team. And Sir, Foyle, Sir Fred Hoyle said that uh, they were familiar with that research and so naturally the host asked, what do you think of this? Well, here's a very important life lesson, my friends. Sir Fred Hoyle basically said that he thought it was crazy, that it was ridiculous to think that the universe began in some sort of a big bang. Now, the uh, Gamal research team hadn't come up with any sort of name for their proposal in showing the common sense of how galaxies are indeed moving away from us, which we have evidence for. Then it would only make sense that they were closer back in time. And so uh, Sir Fred Hoyle ended up serendipitously naming Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. You need to be careful what you're critical of. And when you speak uh, in jest, perhaps you forever get associated with something that doesn't match with your way of thinking. Sir Fred Hoyle is what we uh, consider a steady state uh, cosmologist, where steady state cosmologists advocate that the way the universe is now, the way it has always been, and the way it will always be. So Sir Fred Hoyle, forever associated with a counter concept at the time. Describe Planck time both quantitatively and qualitatively. This is Max Planck here, and Max Planck's adult autograph, I say adult autograph or signature, as this was his 10-year-old signature. Uh, I think I'm going to start putting a period at the end of my signatures. Smith dot. All right, so Max Planck viewed here. He was told by a professor to not go into physics because almost everything is already discovered. Planck said he didn't want to discover anything, just learn the fundamentals. He went on to originate quantum theory and win a Nobel Prize. So he opened up the door for an entire new field of study within physics. And here he is on the left presenting the Nobel Prize to Albert Einstein in 1905. Google Doodle in honor of the 156th time that Planck's DNA has revolved around the sun. 
quantitatively, so using numbers, quantitatively Planck's time is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Planck's number, or Planck's time rather, is one of the most incredible numbers in all of the cosmos, in my little opinion. And to truly appreciate this number, let's take it out of scientific notation. So we have a 1 here, and that means I'm going to move this decimal to the left 43 times. So I'm going to have 43 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43 decimal. Just try and take that number in. That is Planck's time, units of seconds. That Planck's time number represents how much we've been able to trace the nucleus of every atom from the present time all the way right to your 10 dressadillions of a second after the expansion of the Big Bang singularity. The established field of cosmology within astronomy is relatively a new field, getting its beginnings around about the 1900s, early 1900s, 1920s, and this number, 10 to the minus 43 seconds, represents just an incredible amount of knowledge gained in a relatively short time. No pun intended with Planck's time being such a short amount of time. That number is representing how far back cosmologists have been able to trace the atomic origins all the way back. Another way to look at this Planck's time is right now, current time, present, and we go all the way back to this 10 to the minus 43 seconds, and that question area of, okay, what happened from the nothingness to an enormous expansion of this singularity, incom incomprehensibly dense singularity, to expand and become the cosmos. So the cosmology is uh, still investigating and wanting to get this number even smaller, smaller, smaller. But it's just incredible to think that science has been able to trace the nucleus of all matter all the way to a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a second after the initial expansion. So present time we can trace and provide evidence for the atomic nucleus for everything all the way to a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a second before that singularity has its initial expansion. That's why I think this 10 to the minus 43 seconds is just such an incredible number. Uh, so much work has gone done into cosmology and finding the evidence for the origins of atomic nuclei. Always good to remind ourselves in cosmology to take a breath, recognize how incredible our understanding of the cosmos is, and as is the way with cosmology, how much more there is to try and comprehend and understand. Just to try and help you with realizing how small a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a second is, Planck's time, there are more atoms in a glass of water than glasses of water in all the oceans on Earth. More atoms in a glass of water than glasses of water in all the oceans of Earth. And those atoms are way small, too small to represent the size of the singularity. An atom is enormous compared to the singularity. Listen to this. Each drop of water we drink may have once been a glacier, Attila the Hun. Stu, Mike Tyson Sweat, Liberace's bathwater, drool from a... And yes, you remember the first time you learned about the water cycle in grade school. Statistically, at least one molecule of 
hydrogen dioxide, water, H2O, out of every glass of water you have ever drank once passed through a dinosaur. Furthermore, research shows that up to 50% of the water in your drinking glass was created over 4.5 billion years ago, which means that Earth's water is older than the solar system, the sun, and Earth itself. In a grasp the scale and proportion of Planck's time, think about this. The smallest measurement of time is known as Planck time. It takes about 550,000 trillion Planck times to blink your eye once. Blink your eye one time and 550,000 trillion Planck times have just passed. That's how tiny a Planck unit of time is. That is how close our understanding and evidence for the time after the expansion has taken us to. Absolutely impressive. And see if your brain can take this in. There are more units of Planck time in one second than all the seconds since the expansion of the singularity. Our universe is about 14 and a half billion years old. 13 to 14 and a half billion years old. How long is a billion seconds? You may recall it's just over 31 years. A million seconds, 11 days. One billion seconds, about 32 years. One trillion seconds, 32,000 years. Since I've thrown the term trillion out there, let's consider the wonderful world of shuffling. So just a little side note here while we're blowing our minds with cosmological principles here. If every star in our galaxy had a trillion planets, each with a trillion people living on them, and each of these people has a trillion packs of cards, and somehow they manage to make unique shuffles 1,000 times per second, all of this mind-boggling, and they'd been doing that since the Big Bang expansion, they'd only just now be starting to repeat shuffles. Maybe not have thought about the factorial nature of a 52-card deck. Breathe, my friends. Breathe. Let's go back to the two major takeaways from that. The smallest measurement of time is known as Planck time. It takes about 550,000 trillion Planck times to blink your eye once. Think about how monumentally big one trillion is. It takes about 550,000 trillion Planck times to blink your eye. And the astounding, there are more units of Planck time in one second than all the seconds since the expansion of the singularity. Welcome to cosmology. Describing Planck time both quantitative and qualitatively. So quantitatively, it's the 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And be sure you always put the units of seconds on there. And qualitatively, so without the numbers, what we're saying is cosmologists have been able to provide evidence for how all the atomic nuclei in our universe came to be from the time of the Big Bang expansion after the one millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a second. So essentially, cosmologists can trace back the origins of atomic nuclei right up to the fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second. Astounding work that's gone on in the various decades of cosmological research.